Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and on today's episode, we're talking about the profound ways that nutrition impacts mental health and brain function for children and adults. I have guests on the show regularly to talk about various aspects of the nutrition brain connection. Today is particularly exciting for me as one of my heroes in nutrition and mental health research, Dr. Julia Rucklidge, is joining us on the show. Her research, along with that of Dr. Bonnie Kaplan, who was with us on the show a couple of months ago, was a big part of my professional shift to understanding how nutrition impacts mental health for children and how we can use nutritional interventions clinically to support patients. We're going to talk about her research, why nutrition isn't more mainstream in the world of mental health, and her new book, The Better Brain, Overcome Anxiety, Combat Depression, and Reduce ADHD and Stress with nutrition. Let me tell you a little bit more about Julia. She's a professor of clinical psychology in the School of Psychology, Speech and Hearing at the University of Canterbury, the director of the Mental Health and Nutrition Research Lab, and co-author of The Better Brain. Originally from Toronto, Canada, she completed her PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Calgary, and in 2000, she immigrated to New Zealand. Over the last 20 years, Professor Rucklidge has become well known for her research investigating the interface between nutrition and mental health and has published over 140 scientific papers. Her TEDx talk, The Surprisingly Dramatic Role of Nutrition in Mental Health, which is somewhat controversial for crazy reasons that we're going to get into, has been viewed over 1.7 million times. Having witnessed conventional treatments failing so many people, Julie is passionate about helping people find alternative treatments for their psychiatric symptoms. Through her focus on translating research into practice, she hopes to make nutritional interventions mainstream. Julia, thank you for being here. Welcome. Oh, it's my pleasure, Nicole, to be able to talk about this stuff with your audience. We're going to have um, a great time and probably struggle to keep it within the time limits, but we're going to we're going to make a go of it here. I want to start um, with just having you share with all of us how you got into the realm of looking at the intersection of nutrition and mental health. How did that come about for you? Sure. Well, I completely bo- blame Bonnie Kaplan. So, <laughs> and you've had her on your show. Yeah. So, I did my PhD with Bonnie uh, from uh, 1995 to 1998. And during that time, I, I, and my PhD was on uh, looking at uh, the effects of ADHD on women. So, it was the, for, actually one of the first studies that had been done looking at the psychosocial impacts of ADHD on sort of overall women's functioning. So not to do with nutrition. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. And but while I was doing my PhD, Bonnie was approached by some families from southern Alberta, Canada, who suggested that you could use nutrients in a you know pill form of vitamins and minerals to treat very serious psychiatric dis, um, disorders like bipolar, like psychosis, like depression. And uh, and you and I'm sure Bonnie might have said something like, well, when they first approached her, she just said it was snake oil and she didn't right. want to have anything to do with it. So. Um, But what is wonderful about Bonnie and the kind of thing that I like to instill in my own PhD students now is that she's incredibly open to new ideas and she's, you know, and she's a a fantastic scientist, a great critical thinker, and you've got to be led by the data. Mm -hmm. I mean, data either should data data should change your mind. So if you have enough compelling data that suggests that you should actually rethink of how you conceptualize and understand a mental illness, then do that because we can't just get stuck in the way we think about things. So, so she at least had the integrity to do a small clinical trial and that those data showed really wonderful reductions in bipolar disorder symptoms with a simultaneous reduction in use of medications in a fairly small group of people with bipolar disorder. And she published that in 2000 or early part of the century and just had an absolute terrible time since and in terms of being able to continue to conduct research. So I was intrigued, but to be honest, I'd been taught nutrition really wasn't relevant to our brain. And I had a tra- very traditional clinical psychology training. I suspect you were taught the same thing. Absolutely. Especially when it came to ADHD, which was my area of, of research. Um, I remember meeting families and you know parents during my graduate training who would tell me about these alternative things they were doing. And I'd go, 
whoa, why are you doing that? The research shows that it just doesn't work and that medication is the only way you can treat this mm -hmm. really serious condition. And I and and that had been instilled in me. And of course, when you're a graduate student, you don't challenge right. the, that you, what you're taught. You're like, this is what it is. They they must know. And and now I come to you know realize that a lot of those parents were probably right. Yeah. And I, while I, I dismissed it as a graduate student, I started listening uh, when I finished. And I, and I, it's not that I, and to be honest, I was listening at the time, but I just, I struggled to kind of figure out how to put it into what I knew. Mm -hmm. And I just, it just didn't fit. So it just kept bouncing off of my worldview. So I had to change my worldview to kind of get where they were coming from. Um, so. So Bonnie did this really interesting research. I was intrigued, but was kind of like, oh, but um, you know, that's not something I'm going to study. <laughs> so, um, and I went off and I did a postdoc um, in Toronto with Rosemary Tannock at the Hospital for Sick Children and looked at adolescents with ADHD and more of the neurocognitive functioning and some of that, the aspects associated with that. Moved to New Zealand and Bonnie came to visit us in New Zealand um, in 2000, I think it was 2003. Um, and she presented some of these data and I, and you just watch and going, wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, and it, by then I was qualified, you know, still naive, but kind of going, you know what I've seen, I thought that all these treatments like psychotherapy and medications, I thought they were the answer. I thought they treated everybody and everyone got well. And that's kind of the story I was under the impression of, well, it doesn't take long before you kind of go, that's not enough people are getting well yeah. with our current treatments. We, it, and we owe it to the public, to the people who are struggling with these conditions to continue to, to explore new ways of thinking about them because you only get so far if you stay in these narrow ways of conceptualizing a mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, I took on what I see as being a really essential component of being a scientist, which is the critic and conscience of society. And that is that you need to you need to challenge ways of thinking, even if they contravene the current way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so by 2000, and I had to, I had my children in 2002 and 2004. So I was a little busy. It yeah. was not the time to be completely changing your way of uh, your career and your mm -hmm. research plan. I was treading water at the time, mm -hmm. but I once my kids. The youngest went to school, which was 2000, he, 2000 well, yeah, 2009, he started uh, school, per, like at five, that's what happens in New Zealand. Um, so around 2008, 2009, that's when I really got serious about uh, exploring this idea. And I had kind of thought that other people should do it in my community, because Bonnie had come, she talked to psychiatrists, and I really thought this was something that psychiatrists should yeah. study. But um it was too much for them. I really think that it was just too, it just, so it was so didn't fit with their way of, of, of thinking about psychiatric disorders from a, from a pharmaceutical perspective that they just never picked mm -hmm. up and went with it. So in the end I did. And, um, and it started with a case, a case of a young man with obsessive compulsive disorder who I had treated with the best cognitive behavior therapy and, um, and, and, and where he really, you know, he'd gotten a little bit better, but they were, he was still impaired. He was still struggling with these symptoms on a daily basis. And so we had some of these nutrients at the time. And I just said, I don't know. I've heard some case studies, a case from Bonnie about some kids with OCD who got better. I don't know, give it a go. And yeah. so we just monitored him with, you know, with measures of OCD. And we, it was just a remarkable turnaround in a very quick period of time. Mm -hmm. So when that happens to you um, and you see that kind of turnaround, you, you, you owe it to pay attention mm -hmm. because you could say you could dismiss it, which is what I still hear. And it upsets me so much is when, you hear stories of people trying the nutrients and getting so much better and their GPs going, yeah. oh, well, you know, right. yeah, it you would have gotten better anyway. It was yeah. something else right. that happened or you changed your diet or I don't know. Yeah. They, they dismiss it because it, they, they like, like me back when I was a graduate student, I was like, this doesn't fit. I can't understand. This just doesn't, this data doesn't fit with what I understand. So I'm just going to dismiss it. And I just wish people just had the curiosity to think mm -hmm. about things in a different way. So did I, I don't know, did I answer your question? There you go. So I, I had this case and, yeah. and so 
from there, I started more clinical trials, like more open label studies, and then we eventually moved to and did some randomized control trials. And I, I want to get into um, in a in a minute some of the specific research that you've done because it is really compelling and really relevant to what a lot of our listeners um, are dealing with with their kids. But I want to um, just touch on this point of this disconnect between what the data shows and, and the wealth of evidence that we have at this point that nutrition in general makes a difference for brain health and for symptoms of a wide variety of mental health disorders, that targeted nutrients and specific nutrient kinds of formulas can make a difference. We've got this compelling data and yet we do have this real problem in the field of medicine on the whole and, and I would say mental health specifically within that, that we just, it's so difficult to get traction among professionals, whether we're talking about you know, our psychiatrist, our MD, DO colleagues, or we're talking about our psychologist and, you know, social work um, therapist kind of colleagues. There just is um, this disconnect between what we see in the research and what our professional colleagues are willing to sort of acknowledge and incorporate into their understanding of what's going on with people and into their practice. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think to, I would like to be gracious <laughs> to them, to my colleagues, and just think that it's a lack of understanding and education. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, right now, I'm I, for the first time I'm coordinating an undergraduate course in clinical in abnormal psychology, mm -hmm. and I've, you know, we're, we've got one of those standard textbooks, and I'm the, you know. I'm looking at their first few chapters and how they explain that there is nothing in there about the gut nope. and there's nothing in there about uh, how important nutrition is for brain health. Zero, 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 zero. So of course you can imagine, I'm just inserting it into right. all my lectures right. and going and trying to get the students to go, oh my God, that's so awful. Hopefully yeah. we'll see how that goes. But um, I, I think that, you know, if I going going back to my my experience, both as uh, going through school, going through university, uh, is that that was never explained this really basic stuff we learn about nutrition as being important for our our bones mm -hmm. and for growth mm -hmm. but we forget or we've neglected to highlight how important it is for brain development we kind of know that at the level of when you're pregnant mm -hmm. but unfortunately when even when you're pregnant and and I can certainly again talk about my experience it wasn't about what you should eat it was all about what you shouldn't eat right and you're just terrified I'm going to eat some kind of a, a an unwashed salad and that I'm <laughs> going to kill my baby or two so I'll, just, <laughs> I'll, I'll just I'll just avoid salad and yeah. you're and that is just such a bad message to be sending to women who are pregnant that and then again the fish story mm -hmm. We, we've had a greater impact on the cognitive development of children as a consequence of stop, stopping women from eating fish during pregnancy because of the essential, they, they not, the, those, those growing uh, infants aren't getting access to the essential fatty acids that you get out of fish because we're so scared of the effects of the mercury. Yeah. But in fact, that's been more detrimental to their health than having an exposure to a little bit of mercury. So that's now the tide has turned and now it's okay to eat a couple of servings of fish a week now when you're pregnant and you should. Yes. But that, that was a lot of research looking at population data to say, oh my God, that was a bit of a bad, mm -hmm. bad mistake telling women to stop eating fish because of right. the mercury. So, <clears throat> and that's something I'm really grumpy about in general is that we have, we're always about what's not in the food yep. rather than what is in the food. So, you know, something they don't have in America, but I still think it illustrates it really well is that we have these star ratings over here and in the UK, they have these traffic light systems and it's mm -hmm. all on ultra processed food. Yep. And it's about, it's got no calories, no saturated fats, no sodium and no sugar. And it's got one nutrient in there. So right. we'll give it a five-star rating. Yep. And you're kind of like, a cardboard box would get four stars. So yeah. please don't tell me that I should eat that. Yeah. So it's it's this disconnect of not understanding why we should be eating nutrient dense food, why it's relevant to the brain. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, the thing that we go into in a lot of detail in the book that I think is really unique is explaining in, a, in, in words that are so, you know, very clear and understandable. We, we hired um, a writer to help us make sure that our, our you know, what, you know, the academic side of right. writing right. was translated into an easier read, which is so important because we, we take a lot for granted. And so we're explaining that those neurotransmitters that everybody has heard about, I think, because the drug yeah. industry has really made sure that we know about serotonin and all that. To make serotonin, you need neurotransmitter. You, I mean, sorry, you need micronutrients. You yeah. need minerals and vitamins to make these neurotransmitters. So as cofactors, as part of the chemical reactions. Mm -hmm. And so it's like it's like making a, a, a cake and not including your eggs. Well, you're not going to make a cake. So it's the same thing with making your neurotransmitters. If you don't have your minerals and vitamins, it's going to be hard for your brain to make those neurotransmitters that are so important for regulation of your emotions or for regulating your concentration or your sleep and all of these such essential uh, emotional um, functions in our body. So that's what is, I think, missing and why there's a disconnect and why they're scared of it mm -hmm. because they don't understand that basic chem biochemistry because it's kind of being forgotten. I, I think it's, it's totally true. And, you know, speaking for myself, as you said, you know, I went through a very traditional clinical psychology um, PhD training program and, and actually had um, gotten a bachelor's and master's in education prior to that. And in neither of those fields of my training was nutrition even discussed at all beyond things like, you know, obvious starvation, malnutrition, those kinds of things. Mm. Um, but it was when I got into practice and started sort of same thing as you going, wait a second, not everybody's getting better. In fact, seeing more and more kids and young adults who seemed to be getting worse and worse, the more medications that were added, seeing all of these kids with extremely limited diets, very heavily processed diets with overlap of um, you know, physical kinds of uh, issues like prediabetes or asthma or allergies, like seeing all of these pieces and going, huh, you know, I wonder if food has a piece to play in this and, you know, having parents come in who had tried different things and seeing the benefits. And that's when I started really delving into what's out there around this. What research do we have? And was so surprised to find that really, you know, we've had some good evidence. And then in the studies that, you know, you have done and, and others, we've got a really solid body of evidence that says we should be looking at this. And I sort of stood back and went, well, why did nobody tell me about this? You know, I've got all these degrees mm -hmm. and no one told me about this. So I think, I think your point is right on that, you know, professionals by and large aren't being trained in this. And we do um, have a responsibility to stay up to date and look at what's out there yeah. and to see what's evolving and changing. Because as you said early on in our conversation today, we have too many people, children and adults with mental health issues who are not getting better with conventional treatment. In fact, when you really look at the stats on that, we have a pretty sad track record when we just we look do. at things like psychotherapy mm -hmm. and psychiatric medications. Mm -hmm. And so we do owe it to our patients as parents. We owe it to our kids to, to look at these pieces. So I'd love to have you talk a bit, you know, obviously we don't have time to get into all of you know, the details of the many studies you've done, but you have done some very compelling work and have some really strong data around micronutrient formulas and kids with ADHD, with mental health um, issues. I'd love for you to just kind of give our listeners a summary of some of the things that, sure. that you have found. Sure. So the, as you say, the most compelling data we have is with ADHD. And that's because we did a really, you know, very controlled trial that's hard very robust it's yes. done like a drug study and you can't fault it and so if you're if you do want to fault it then you need to fault pharmaceutical yes. data that's as right. well so i ran it just like that analyze the data just like a drug study so um but it wasn't a drug it was just vitamins and minerals and just everything that you would get out of a healthy diet but at a higher dose mm -hmm. so that is important for the listeners to know that we are giving people more than what you get out of a, of a diet and there's a number of reasons for that um and mostly is that maybe some people need more to just 
like build them back up? They've gone through such a long term of depletion. Do we need to kind of really um, uh, saturate them with more nutrients uh, for a while to get them back running at optimal, you know, optimal functioning? In some cases, I think though, in or in, it depends on the condition you're treating. I think in some cases you need to keep going because there's something ge maybe genetically different about them that they do need more nutrients than what you're going to get out of your food. But the study that we did was AD was uh, kids with ADHD and randomized to placebo or micronutrients, and what we found was that uh, uh, that the the effect on ADHD is is mixed, and I'll be very upfront about that. It's not a quick fix for your core symptoms of ADHD. But then when you think, you talk to parents about ADHD and then when you look at it just overall, one of the bigger problems oftentimes is the stuff that goes along with ADHD that you see with those kids and that's like emotional dysregulation or a lot of uh, challenges with um, regulating their anger. Um, it's uh, that irritability and they're all, they're, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, research now and a, a number of professionals and scientists are saying we've been neglecting this what looks like actually it's a core component of ADHD it's this emotional dysregulation so that is where the effect is the most robust is the strongest is in helping these kids regulate their emotion that means though that over time so when we so in the eight weeks of an RCT that's the part that we see as being the strongest effect. And clinically, we see them as being overall functioning better than kids in the placebo. And they're happier, they seem calmer. Yes, they still might have some ADHD symptoms in that short burst of time that we're observing them, but a whole bunch of other things seem to be a whole lot better. So that's really, for me, exciting because it's not a, giving nutrients is like a metabolic tune-up. It's not specific to a symptom. It's a, it really is providing the body with what it needs in order to try to heal itself. Now, when it, though, what I'd say though, when I look at the long-term data, and that's the people who stay on the nutrients, that's when we really see the robust effects on ADHD. So does it need more time to correct some of those really long-standing challenges? Maybe. Um, it's not to say that we don't see it in the short term, but it's not definitely not as strong as medications in the short term. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, yeah. that's when we see these kids in remission and like just not do not meet criteria for ADHD in the more, anymore. And that's at the one year follow up. I mean, maybe they achieve that at six months. Not sure because that's not how we designed the study. But at one year, we see 80% of the kids who stay on nutrients are in remission. Yeah. They're perfectly normal, normal, happy kids. The kids who go on to medication, who choose to go on medication after they finish the trial, are not doing as well as the kids who are on the nutrients. So do they represent a different type of child? Very possibly they're the kids who maybe they didn't do as well on the nutrients, whole host of other reasons you could think of that explain that. But really, if those medications are as good as we hear, think they are, those kids should be just as good as those kids on nutrients, yeah. but they're not. And they're more yeah. depressed and they're more anxious. So, yep. you know, if I was a parent with a child with ADHD, I'd go, okay, I know this is gonna be, a, it's not gonna be a quick fix. Mm -hmm. I should also be looking at um, the, making sure that my child is getting the most nourishing foods possible, mm -hmm. do my best to fight against the trend of giving kids ultra processed food all the time. There is no room for fizzy drinks in a good diet. Yeah. It's not, it's yeah. not, it, they don't, it shouldn't be in there. Um, and, and then the, in the course, in some cases, then the additional nutrients are going to be necessary to get a child to that place. But it's not a quick fix. Whereas Ritalin, you see the effects within four hours. It's very, in, you know, it's it's compelling. It's attractive. Uh, but in the long term, you're not, you. I don't think you're going to get to the same place with your child. I, that's exactly what I see in my practice with using the nutrients. And the thing with you know, Ritalin and, you know, they're talking about any of the stimulant medications or even some of the non-stimulants now. Yes, for, for kids who are responders to those, you do see this quick, you know, improvement. However, the thing that kids and parents are constantly complaining about is the steep drop-off then as soon as the medication wears off. 
you know, so it's like, okay, that was in the system for four hours or an extended release, maybe eight hours. And now, okay, the kid's home from school. Now we're dealing with the back end of that. We can't give more Ritalin because they won't sleep and they won't eat. And now they're crashing from that, the irritability. And so just all of these other pieces and issues that for many, many kids accompany the taking yeah. of the stimulant medications, exactly. whereas we don't see those same problems with kids not at all. nutrients. Yeah, not at all. You get the, and in fact, you get the opposite. As right. I said, the probably the some of the first uh, symptoms to improve are irritability, and so you and you never get you don't get that crash. Although what we do hear is that I know when my child has missed a dose of micronutrients, yes. I often hear that, yep. and so and it's it's probably more of a, I don't know, maybe they just, they don't deal with like, there's a, a change in the situation and you can see that suddenly they're not dealing with it as well. Mm -hmm. They're not coping with it as well, or it's that kind of change as opposed to something really quite obvious, but they just know something's not quite right about their kid and that they, and then you, they realize, oh, they missed their dose. So, uh, but you certainly don't get that crash mm -hmm. that you see with, with Ritalin. So that's, that is one of the plus sides of the micronutrients compared to Ritalin. Um, but, you know, Ritalin has a place. I, I just, if, again, it's just, I, because of the, you know, some of the, the long-term effects of Ritalin that are, some of them are, are known, right. the effects, the one that worries the, me the most is the effect that it has on, on, on growth velocity and overall height. Yeah. I just, I can't help but just kind of go, oh, what else is it doing if it's yep. suppressing height? Right. You know, what other effects that we haven't measured? And mm -hmm. there may be no others, um, but that one does worry me a little bit. But with the nutrients, one of the things that we observed in our, our study was that the kids on the micronutrients grew just a little bit taller than the kids who were on placebo. Now, it was a trend. So it was a, which means that you need it replicated, mm -hmm. um, but it was a pretty intriguing um, and, and, and you know, a somewhat surprising finding because we weren't looking for that. Mm -hmm. It just happened that we were like, oh my God, these kids are a little bit taller yeah. in eight weeks. Yeah. So what does that mean over the long term? Mm -hmm. I mean, feed, you feed a plant, it will grow. Right. I think that's, it, it's not rocket science. No, and we've seen that trend sort of in general in worldwide data over the last several decades of looking just at height and size overall as it's connected to ultra processed foods being introduced into, you know, um, it's, some of our communities being the main food source. And so it's interesting to think about those things. And I also think it's really interesting some of the emerging research now that we have had um, children for um, several decades uh, who now are adults who have been on these medications. Now we're starting to see some of those studies, right, of longer term things and looking at some of the effects, um, not necessarily uh, related to stimulants, but certainly related to some of the antidepressant medications and things of vulnerabilities and issues that come up then later in a person's life when they've yeah. you know, been started on these. And I think that's one of the things that concerns so many parents is you know, this feeling of their child being used as a guinea pig when it comes to these medications, because we just don't have good long-term data. Um, we can't yeah. tell a parent if you start your five-year-old on an antidepressant medication, what that's going to look like later on in their life necessarily. Um, and so many of just the side effect concerns. And, and I think the bigger picture is just the large number of children and adults who don't get perceptibly better with the interventions that we have. And to me, that's ev that provides all the reason we need to look at other options that can be supportive. Not to say that therapy isn't appropriate. It certainly is. Not to say that medications are never appropriate. They certainly can be. But to say, how can we make our outcomes even better. And, and I have long felt that if there were drug trials that got results um, as strong and robust as some of these micronutrient trials, it would be all over the news. And yet when we're talking about things like vitamins and minerals, doesn't quite get the airtime. It never does. And that's one of the challenges we're having with, um, you know, just overall publicity of the book yes. is that you, the, 
there's we're staying away from what's I think some of the asset, the core pieces and really interesting parts of the the book are about the research that we've done mm -hmm. and we have to keep minimizing it because if you if you if the book is seen as being a book about supplements mm -hmm. which it isn't it's just yes. a it's just yeah. a it's the overall piece of it then nobody's going to the media are going to aren't going to like it and they cuz they only like stories that are bad news stories about supplements <laughs> so I don't know right. but the the our research really what i if it can do one thing is that it puts nutrition back on the map because yes. it's a proof of principle it's yes. proving that minerals and vitamins have a positive effect on some symptoms for some people it's yes. not a cure it doesn't cure everybody I, it's something that keeps me up at night going why didn't some kids get better why was there no change whatsoever we gave right. them so many nutrients something else is going on we haven't figured that out yet but so many kids do well. And so what is it saying? That is something we need to pay attention to. If these minerals and vitamins can have such a powerful effect for, for these children, mm -hmm. then that should force us all to go, hold on, where do we get those minerals and vitamins yeah, from? Right. Oh, we get them from our food. Mm -hmm. Oh, ha are the foods that I'm feeding my children really that nourishing? Maybe I need to reconsider making sure that they're more nutrient dense. Mm -hmm. So that's if I can do that, that's I'm happy. It's such, it's such an important thing. And, and I want to touch on that. This leads into a little bit of, you know, what I think would be interesting for our listeners. Um, what I consider some ridiculous controversy, but the whole hubbub that happened with your TEDx talk that it yeah. basically, you know, you, you did. And, and for all of you listening, if you have not seen Julia's TEDx talk, look it up. It's a wonderful sort of synopsis of the things that we're talking about today, but really great to pass along to you know, family members or even professionals who you're working with who maybe are new to this, but you presented, you know, just data, research, like, you know, this wasn't just, oh, I'm Julia and these are my ideas about what I think is helpful. You presented data and that talk ended up getting labeled with um, a warning that said that, you <laughs> no. know, you should be careful about consuming this information because it may not, you know, it, it's not substantiated. So, say a little bit about that. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's painful. Yeah. It was one of the most upsetting things to happen in my career was to have that flag. Um, and it was a few years ago now. Um, but it was, I was ashamed to be honest, like, you know, having this talk that I had worked so hard on and I knew was robust on the science and to have Ted come along and put that flag on to say, she's a quack. Yep. She's, you know, she's not legitimate. This, you shouldn't pay attention to this research. It was incredibly hurtful, and I was it was I like I I was in absolute tears over it because it it just brought so much shame. It's like it's like your house getting tagged. It's like right. things that you know, and you couldn't I couldn't erase it. I couldn't do anything about it. I all I could do was you know get the community to try to write to Ted. I wrote letters. The curator, the local curator yeah. at TEDx Christchurch, wrote letters to them. And I, uh, and it, all it did was that we were finally able to change a little bit of the wording mm -hmm. because at the time it said she's, you know, she's gone outside of the curatorial guidelines, right. which makes, and when you look at the curatorial guidelines, it's things like, oh, she doesn't have a PhD or she's not right. a scientist. So, or she's, you know, made up her science, like a whole bunch. And you're like, but I tick, tick, tick. I meet all those boxes. So they must have had so much pressure from someone mm -hmm. or some big industry yes. uh, that they could not take the flag down. And mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, it, it, what was interesting that my, my, my husband's a journalist. And so he uncovered that Merck is a, is a, is a, a and I was like, what? The sponsor of I Ted, just, right? A sponsor of Ted. And you're right. like, yeah. how can this be? Right. How can this be? So did that, I don't know. You, you don't want to come up with too many conspiracy theories or it'll drive you crazy. But um, some there was some kind of pressure on Ted to keep that flag up there. So the best we could do, and that is the flag that's there at the moment, is that she oversimplified legitimate studies. Yes. And you're just like, who doesn't oversimplify that's in right. 18 minutes? That's right. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's there. And it's, and I can kind of live with that. Uh, um, 
it's I'd rather it wasn't there at all because it suggests that what I do is fringe and it's not yeah. and there's so much research now so much more in than there was in 2014 when I did that we now have randomized control trials showing the benefit of of the Mediterranean diet compared to control we've got more research replication on the studies that I talked about at the time um, so there's more now than there was in 2014 so it's still painful that it's there um, but I don't think it's ever going to I don't know how to get it to come down and believe me I did everything in my power right. to and I used every bit of iota of science and argument right very well crafted letters to Ted that were completely pretty much ignored the, the reason, well I mean I we got this the right. flag slightly changed but I'm still grumpy. the reason I raised that not to like you know have your pain <laughs> fresh but I think it's really important for our listeners to understand what we're all up against with this. And, and mm -hmm. I mean what I said a few minutes ago, where if we had as robust of data for many yeah. of the pharmaceutical interventions or mm -hmm. even other kinds of therapeutic interventions that are used with kids and adults that we yeah. have with some of these, you know, nutritional things, it would be all over. And I know. And, and I so I think it's really important for for people to understand. And for those of you who are listening as parents or, or even professionals, if you've had the experience of being dismissed by your child's pediatrician, by your own primary health care provider, by mental health people that you are, you know, working with or, or talking with when you bring up nutrition, I want you to know you're not alone. I experience that all the time, and I am a highly degreed credentialed professional. Julia's saying she's the one who's done a lot of this research. She has the data, and the same thing happens. And I think that's really important for us to understand that there are forces out there that make it difficult for um, practitioners, for the mass you know, population at large to have this information. And that doesn't mean we're wrong to be exactly. looking at these things. It doesn't mean we're wrong to be researching these things. In fact, it should strengthen our resolve to do even more to get this information out there, to apply this information. And so I, I just, I think that's a really important and powerful takeaway from that. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more is that, um, there's there are powerful forces uh, that 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 have the potential to lose a lot from this research. So and they're two of the biggest companies in the world and the most powerful, and that's the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry. That's right. So they are going to do everything they can because wouldn't you if that was you know yeah. your livelihood and your stock prices was dependent on ensuring that the public continued to purchase your products? Yeah. So. It's, it's, I, it, you know, from that side, it's not surprising, but I just wish humanity would prevail. Yeah, I, I just I hear the, that. Yeah. And I wish the compassion towards people who are struggling with mental health issues would, would be at the top, the highest um, point of interest and that that's what we should care about, you know, and it, and it doesn't so far. I mean, I, What's, what's such a struggle here in New Zealand, and we're just a small country, 5 million, um, we have a wonderful prime minister, but I still can't make inroads on right. changing how things are done right. in New Zealand. And again, as you say, in there's the so US, much forget about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we were, we were able to change gun laws within a few yeah. weeks of that mosque shooting that That's happened right. here in Christchurch. That's right. So if there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. So if there was the will to say, you know what? We're, we should accept that these pharmaceuticals are not doing enough good things for our children. There's this amazing research that's locally grown yeah. um, that is showing another way forward. Let's pull out all the red tape that's stopping this from becoming mainstream. Yeah. That's right. It shouldn't be me who has to do that because I right. can't do it. It's got to come from, from someone who's got that political clout and power. That's right. Um, and that's yeah. where I think though that each of us as individual consumers Consumers yeah. of the things that we're purchasing food-wise, we have seen huge shifts in that over the last yeah. decade, where pretty much any supermarket, at least in the U.S. now, that you go in, you have a much 
um, wider array of options for organic, for you know, getting high fructose corn syrup out. We vote uh, and, and send the message to corporations about what's important to us and how we spend our money. And that's true in food. And I believe it's true in the kind of care that we seek out uh, medically as well. And the I kinds sure of so. things that we choose to do um, treatment wise for ourselves and our kids. And so while I do think we need to continue to try to make inroads uh, politically and, and you know where, where the dollars are in terms of our governments and things with this, I, I don't wanna overlook the power that each of us has as an individual, as a parent, as an educator, as a therapist, as a whoever, to make a dent in that by you know how we choose to engage, how we choose to spend our money, because ultimately that's that's what speaks when it comes exactly. to exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. Tell yeah. us. Um, I, I want to dive into um, having you share um, a bit about what people can expect with the book. But you you know you always have. Um, lots of studies going on. What's something in the pipeline that you're most excited about research-wise? Either your own research or research that you're aware of related to all of this that you're yeah. excited about right now. Yeah, um, I think th there's a lot that's going on um, in terms of the ADHD work that we've done. There's a replication that's completed in, in the United States that was led by Dr. John Jenny Johnston and some te other people at Ohio State University or uh, Oregon. Um, Health Sciences University, so that those data may be out uh, by the time the show goes live. Yeah. So uh, um, that's exciting because replication, as I said, is so important. So we'll, you know, we, you know, we're just waiting mm -hmm. for those results. Um, some other exciting things that are happening are are the is the research that's on the microbiome yes. and just exploring that yes. and sort of better understanding the role that our bacteria have in our mental health and it's so new and exciting but we don't know really what it means and so yeah. that's something that I'm constantly keeping my eye open for is better understanding that and I don't think we have a lot that we can share at this stage because there's so much unknown but I think it's a great it'll it's going to offer some great opportunities for treatment for mental health illnesses in the future. I agree. Um, we have, we're, we, we're just at the moment finishing a whole bunch of, of research and I kind of want to keep, could sort of take stock on that and, and figure out some ways, you know, where we're going um, next. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I feel I, I want to go back to, you know, I, I did some research with adults and then we did mm -hmm. research with kids. And then the, uh, we've done a study that uh, was done with women in pregnancy who are struggling with depression. So, you know, we wait for those results. That's, that's kind of, we're in the process of just, um, we'll, we'll start delving into that soon. So what I'm actually really interested in that study is to see whether or not we have any effects on birth outcomes because yeah. we're following these uh, the infants and what happened, you know, can we have an effect on prematurity or weight at birth based on micronutrients during pregnancy. So there's some really exciting, um, I hope, science that we're going to uncover with that study. Um, but uh, we're now moving back into children. We've got a couple of studies that are going to start with kids. And really, the thing I said about that study with ADHD was that the big effect was on dysregulation. And so we want to recruit a bunch of adolescents who are mood dysregulated and and target that specifically it doesn't that those that constellation of symptoms doesn't seem to do very well with medication but to be honest one of the things about the exciting things about going back to child research is that they their brains at least in new zealand i don't know if this is true in the united states but at least in new zealand they haven't had the same level of exposure to medications and so they are what I call medication naive. One of the challenges of the nutrients is the medication. Yes. And sure. so when you're working with the adult population, the majority are either on medication or have been on medication. Mm -hmm. And I just worry about the effect that the medications is having on their brain wiring long-term. Mm -hmm. And I do think that means that if you are an adult with a chronic condition, I don't know if you've had the same experience, mm -hmm. but my kind of clinical experience with them, with people like that, chronic condition, chronic mental health issues, uh, have been on medications, they just seem to take a lot longer to yeah. recover. Yeah. And that nutrient for nutrients to have the effect. Whereas with kids, we tend to see the effects much more quickly. And, you know, that's kind of more mm -hmm. rewarding is yeah. to see effects 
more quickly. I, I think that that's true. And one of the challenges, unfortunately, in the United States, we do medicate kids um, earlier and more often than many other parts of the world. So it is uh, not uncommon at all. In fact, it's very much the norm in my um, clinic to have kids come in who are on one, two, three, up to 10 um, different psychiatric drugs. The average number of drugs that kids are on who come to our clinic is two and a half um, oh, prescriptions goodness. at the time of intake. So unfortunately, in the US, we do a lot more with that. I think what's important for parents to understand is that, you know, I can say anecdotally, at least, um, and we do have some, you know, certainly research on this as well, these kids can do very well on nutrients. We have to be more cautious about yeah. how we um, titrate up the nutrients, how exactly. those interact with those psychiatric drugs, carefully tapering down yeah. those medications because the effects of those can become potentiated by the nutrients. So it's certainly, there is more complexity. Exactly. And you need a good physician and you need a physician who's on board. That's right. So That's exactly yeah, right. otherwise but, it doesn't it, work, Yeah, but it can be done. And I, I think, you know, I just want parents to hear that. Yeah. That I it can be done. Any kids, um, you know, in our practice who do very well with the nutrients um, yep. and, and are able to at least come down on or completely come off of their medications. You just have to do that in a very um, informed and, and careful and collaborative way. Absolutely. And yeah. I agree with you is that it can be done. It's just a bit more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. As a scientist, that makes doing controlled right. trials a lot more difficult. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Well, we're excited about um, all these studies. I, I you know, watch um, the space where you uh, provide information carefully, looking at the journals coming out, excited to see those. Um, I want, before we wrap up, to have you share with people about the book. So this is exciting, The Better Brain, you and Bonnie Kaplan together on this. Just give us a quick snapshot of what people can expect to get and, and where they can access it. Sure. Well, you can probably access it from any bookstore, Amazon, uh, through the publisher, HMH. Uh, I, I'm, I, I don't think that's going to be so it's out there. It, yeah. Everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So not hard to buy The Better Brain. And then if you just put that together with uh, Kaplan and or Rutledge, you will find it. Um, so, so yes, it's out there and it's, it, it covers a lot of the ground that we've covered today, really helps people understand why we should care, why we should care about nutrients, why in some cases, a uh, diet manipulation isn't sufficient, but our message is food first. Yes. That's really primary food first, food first, because even though lots of people say they eat well, when we look at the, the data, the dietary surveys, 50% of the calories that North Americans eat comes from ultra processed food. Right. So, and that's, that's based on assuming people are honest about what they eat. Right. So I, I suspect it might even be higher yeah. and that only, no more than 20% of the adult population is hitting their, even their, their daily quota for fruit and vegetables. So we have a long way to go to get that right. So that's why our message really is food first, then supplements, uh, it, if, if that's not sufficient and try the supplements and then we get the wealth of data, very, no cherry picking. We talk about the pros, we talk about the cons, we talk about some of the studies that haven't worked, why we think they haven't worked, so that you get a really honest opinion, uh, you know, review of that research. Um, and then we've also got recipes in there that are, tr we try to make them, uh, well, of course, healthy, but also uh, cost conscious so that they practical. are using ingredients <laughs> and practical and hopefully not too hard to follow. So, right. um, and hopefully a sort of a vision for the future that is going to be different than the one that we have right now. So that's yeah. the book. Oh, it's so exciting. When I first heard about the project, so excited about it. All of you listening, because my audience is so uh, supportive of these topics, this information. Um, I want all of you to go now, whether it's Amazon, your local books or wherever, go buy the book, support the important, important work and research that Julia and Bonnie and their teams are doing. Um, get the book, read it for yourself, uh, share the information with your healthcare providers, with the mental health people that you're coming in contact with. Read the book and then pass it along or get somebody else a copy. We need to get this information in the hands of more people who are uh, engaged with working with kids and adults around these really um, important issues. So um, I, I know that my community will be big supporters of this. And um, Julia, I really appreciate during this very busy time with uh, the book coming out that you were able to take
take some time for us today. Uh, great conversation. Thank you for the work that you're doing and thank you for being here with us. Oh, well, thank you very much, Nicole, for having me. And I we certainly hope it makes a difference. Absolutely. And thanks to all of you for listening. As always, we will catch you back here next week for our next episode of The Better Behavior Show.